When trains helped lead the westward expansion, we were there. Then as motor vehicles became the dominant mode of transportation and our interstate highway system expanded nationwide, we were there. And right now, as cities prepare for the future of mobility, we are here. HNTB is helping communities connect people and places, and so much more. We are here to leave a permanent impact where we live and work. By rethinking the future of transportation, we're bringing people together and expanding opportunity. Working with you to create the infrastructure solutions that turn your challenges into successful community icons. You don't have to look far to see our impact. All across the country, you'll find places where our innovative spark is generating ideas to strengthen communities. So when it comes to achieving your goals and leaving a legacy, no challenge is too big. And as we head into the future prepared to hand off the world to our children, we're reimagining everything from the ground up and harnessing the power of collaboration. We are here to create the community that's important to you, to all of us. We have been a part of your community in the past. We are here now, and we will continue to be here with you as we work together to build our community, our home. everybody it's great to see you here today and um, we're happy to welcome you <coughs> to the uh, to the regional transportation dialogue so welcome glad to see you all here um, we're gonna get started almost immediately just so because we have a big program today and we're very excited about having lots of conversation with all of you because these really are dialogues we hope to have your engagement as well as listening to a series of really great speakers today on congestion pricing. Briefly just to introduce myself, I'm Kimberly Collins. I am the Executive Director of the Leonard Transportation Center. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to one of our major sponsors and great friend when it comes to the transportation dialogue, um, Will Allen for HNTB. Will, please. Well, good morning, everybody. On behalf of HNTB and its 500 plus tolling professionals engaged in complex user fee projects across the country, it's an honor to sponsor today's conversation focused on congestion pricing here in the Inland Empire. Congestion pricing is here with price facilities on the 91 and the 15. And before we know it on I-10, this price management lane growth is forming a network that will transform mobility here in Southern California. I'm proud to be leading HNTB's Southern California Towing and Emerging Mobility Solutions team that has helped our clients deliver or operate each of the express lanes operating in the region. Currently, I'm supporting Tim Byrne, Philip Chu, and panelist Gary Coho with the launch of SPCTA's first toll facility, something I'm sure we'll hear about later this morning. I'm super excited to hear about what this panel is currently doing in this field and what we should anticipate in the near future. So welcome, everybody. I can't wait to hear more about your thoughts. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you for that great opening. Um, now I'd like to pass it on to our Associate Dean of the Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration, Dr. Anna Nee, to give a few remarks on behalf of our college. Good morning, everybody. It's really good to see everybody so early in, <laughs> in uh, uh, Zoom. And uh, your program says Dean Rose will speak, uh, but however, we are uh, currently undergoing a transition of leadership. Dean Rose is retiring. So we are going to uh, welcome a new interim dean in August, um, uh, external. <laughs> so then uh, we will start a formal dean search. So I'm just here to say a few words. And um, we are very happy to see this center's dialogues has got a lot of sponsorship. Uh, we really appreciate your sponsorship and hopefully you will continuously supporting this program. Uh, I believe this dialogue is very meaningful at this time, as we are facing a new time after the pandemic. Uh, a recent study shows that uh, over 80% of uh, people below 30 think the pandemic is significantly changed their life perspective. I believe this will have a huge impact about telecommute or te commuting <laughs> commute as well. So um, uh, the dialogue will help tangle the inland's uh, growing traffic congestion problem and your engagement and collaboration will definitely help investigate whether we could 
uh, whether this congesting price will help to uh, equitably and efficiently manage our region's road work, road work, roadway network. So uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy this dialogue and uh, have a lot of takeaway <laughs> with you and help uh, uh, improve our region's uh, traffic. And uh, as uh, uh, JKH Brown College will continue supporting the vision of uh, the Leonardo Transportation Center and to help in this region in a greater uh, transportation system. Um, enjoy your dialogue, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for being here and thank you for representing our college. I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, in particular HNTB, who has been a great partner and collaborator and friend through the, the Transportation Dialogue since its initiation four years ago. Additionally, the San Bernardino International Airport has been a great friend and San Bernardino Valley College in thinking about their new electric um, heavy duty vehicle program. Um, I'd like to thank our, our, our gold sponsors for this year is Woodruff's, Braidland and Smart, um, the Ontario International Airport and Metrolink. Thank you all for your great support in helping us continue with this series. Finally, I'd like to um, thank all of our silver sponsors. I see one of them on my screen here, Doran Barnes. Thank you, Foothill Transit. Also thanks to Omnitrans, PPM Group, VSC Environmental, WIDA Surveying, EXP, HDR, Lane, um, Sully, uh, Sully, Mold, sorry, Sully Miller Contracting Company, um, Advanced Civil Technologies, and S2 Engineering. Um, we thank you all. Oh, else I believe GLA. I don't know if I, I think I missed them. Thank you all for your sponsorship. And again, thank you to the Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration for continuing your support of the Leonard Transportation Center. Um, just a few thanks to not only all of our speakers, we have a great um, lineup for you today, starting off with Patrick DeCorla Sousa, who is from um, the USDOT's Build America Bureau and FHWA Center for Innovative Finance Support. We also have um, Eugenie Pochikin from the CEO, who's from Shiva AI. We have Tam Yun, who is the LA Metro's uh, from the LA Metro's Office of Extraordinary Innovation, to share what's happening over in our, our partner city in Los Angeles. And Gary Coho, who is um, with Advanced Civil Technology and heading up the project um, currently occurring in the Inland Empire with the 10 Freeway. Um, Gary is also a great supporter of the Leonard Transportation Center. I'd be remiss in saying thank you, Gary, for being our advisory council chair. So Gary is a great, is a great supporter and, and friend of the LTC as well. I'd like to thank, of course, all of the staff of the LTC, in particular Kathleen Ramirez, who has always been such a great help in putting these events together and really making sure that we're on time and we have all of our, our P's and Q's and our logistics done. Um, today's session is a little bit different, so I thought I would just share that with you for those who might have been um, at a dialogue before. In the past, we have had breakout rooms and where we've shared our um, our ideas in small groups. This time we're going to do a, a bit different and we're going to have a series of Zoom polls in which to engage you all into thinking about congestion pricing and its place within the Inland Empire. Um, I hope to have a bit of discussion if we can during these polls, but we also have time at the end of all of our speakers presentations for a group really analysis and, and, and discussion. Again, these aren't supposed to be, you know, your talking head presentations. They are to be engagement and to think about ways in which we can move the transportation sector forward within the Inland Empire. So with that, I'd like to um, begin with our first, uh, with our first um, question. Okay, so our first poll here is congestion pricing the solution we are looking for. Yes, no, maybe. And looking for in our transportation solutions as part of our, 
our overall packet of transportation solutions that we have for our region. Then we have our second question here is, um, if congestion pricing is the solution we are looking for, why has it taken so long to implement and choose your top reason why? So is congestion pricing the solution we are looking for? Maybe was our greatest answer. So that is, um, that is something <clears throat> hopefully we can discuss today and really think about. Is it the solution that we're for? And the main reasons why um, the operational challenges to put infrastructure in place was our top reason. Um, there's also looking at the concerns of paying of double paying for infrastructure, concerns about equity and other. Um, so these are something it's, it's also interesting to see that we had a tie for yes and no, and then maybe being the greatest of our responses. So as we um, move forward on our conversation, Let's think about some of these pieces and then how do we move again this conversation about congestion pricing um, forward. Will, do you have any thoughts or should we move right into our... No, great responses. I think that's pretty telling of where I think this conversation will head. So I'm looking forward to, to the next speakers. All right, great. At this time then, I would like to bring up our first speaker um, for today is Patrick de Corla Sousa. Thank you, uh, and thanks, uh, Kimberly. So I saw there, there were quite a few people who were in the maybe column about whether congestion pricing can work. A few were saying yes, and a few saying no. I hope to get more of you into the yes column uh, with this presentation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, congestion pricing in the U.S. and where it has worked. I'll talk about some innovative ideas uh, to overcome some of the hurdles that uh, you raised in that second question. And uh, then I will show with a modeling analysis how congestion pricing can actually work, uh, both uh, in eliminating congestion as well as financial. And then I'll offer a few concluding remarks. Uh, so first, congestion pricing in the U.S. Uh, as many of you know, in a market economy like ours, uh, prices are used to balance demand and supply. Uh, the problem we have on our roads is there are no prices, so there's no pricing mechanism to balance demand and supply so that we have long lines forming on the freeways and other facilities, uh, uh, just as in communist Russia during uh, uh, communist rule, there were long lines at retail stores because of the shortage of supply. We've actually implemented congestion pricing uh, in the United States and uh, actually Southern California made history uh, in 1995, uh, both on SR-91 and I-15, these were the first projects that used variable tolls to manage congestion and keep traffic free-flowing. Since then, taking California's example, there are, there are now 53 operating uh, projects across the United States. We've also had tolls, uh, variable tolls implemented on existing toll bridges. And uh, as you can see, uh, the operational challenges have been overcome and we can do it technically. Uh, recently, New York City is, uh, has made history by approving the first uh, proposal to uh, implement cordon pricing, which means that they will impose tolls on existing roads, existing free roads entering the central business district, and they will use the, uh, the money they get to fund transit, which would be the alternative mode that it would be made available to those who don't want to pay the toll. Now, Southern California may not uh, be the, the prime place you want to implement cordon pricing because 
your congestion is throughout the freeway system. So the question is, can congestion pricing work on the freeway system? And you've uh, mentioned some of the hurdles, uh, technology implement implementation, those have been overcome, but there are some that are really holding back implementing congestion pricing on freeways. Uh, and the main one is the lack of convenient alternatives. People have no other way to get to work. And since they have no other way to get to work, if you're a low income driver, you're paying uh, uh, a large amount of your income uh, for these new tolls and that's inequitable. And if you don't want to the, uh, pay the tolls, you uh, divert to other facilities and cause congestion on those facilities, uh, making uh, the neighbors irate. So can we overcome these hurdles? Actually, there is a way, I said, you need an alternative, that is key. And uh, we know that uh, implementing transit and building transit, uh, rail, for example, is a, a process that takes many years, costs many billions of dollars. So how can we uh, implement congestion pricing today? Is there a way to get these alternatives placed overnight uh, and not without spending the billions of dollars you need for transit. And I would say there actually is a way uh, to create a new mode, a new alternative called incentivized on-demand ride sharing using mobile apps, just like Uber and Lyft. You, uh, you use your mobile phone to get a ride with a uh, driver who is incentivized to pick you up with a uh, subsidy, uh, an incentive, a cash incentive to do so. What that would do would be uh, fill up a lot of empty seats in cars that are right now on the freeway. So without uh, billions of dollars, you would have new capacity made available overnight. All you need is to provide those needed cash incentives. And this has actually been tried out in Northern California. Uh, they provided a subsidy of $2 per person per trip, which is $4 per carpool trip. And were able, as you can see, uh, to get 68% uh, of those who use this new service came from driving alone. Uh, recently in South Bend, Indiana, they've similarly implemented incentivized ride sharing to provide those who don't have a car with rides to work sites. So uh, addressing an equity issue in addition to congestion. Uh, an, a recent study by the Manetta Transportation Institute found that a $5 cash incentive would incentivize 15% of drivers to pick up a passenger. So all it takes is $5. And to ride as a passenger, uh, commuters would need a subsidy or an incentive of just a dollar a day, which is 50 cents a trip. So the total incentive needed to fill up those seats in the car would be just $5.50. So cash incentives provide the, uh, a solution to reducing traffic. Remember, you could fill up those empty seats and that would, of course, reduce traffic. And it also provides an alternative for those who don't have access to a car and addresses equity issues. So why aren't people doing it? Well, there are challenges. Where's the money going to come from? The pilots I mentioned have uh, ended simply because they ran out of money. And another issue is this phenomenon called induced traffic. That is people who, who currently avoid the congested freeways because they are congested would find traffic free flowing 
and they would come back. So how do we solve these problems? And you might have guessed it. Congestion pricing. Congestion pricing means tolls during rush hours only, not throughout the day, just when you need it. And those tolls would go to provide funding for the cash incentives to ride sharers. And at the same time, they would ward off those induced travelers who might come and congest the freeway again. On the other hand, the uh, this new affordable alternative that you're providing uh, addresses the, the main hurdle of congestion pricing, which is people that have currently no alternative if they don't want to pay the toll. So the issue is, will it work? Will just taking away 15% of traffic uh, eliminate congestion? And is it going to be financially viable? Will we get enough money from tolls to pay for those cash incentives. Well, a, an FHWA study found that 10 to 14% reduction in traffic achieves a 75 to 80% reduction in delays. So I did a modeling study to see what the effect of a 12% reduction might uh, entail. And you see on the left, a typical freeway bottleneck it could be in Southern California. Uh, vehicles are arriving at the rate of 2,100 vehicles per hour. So traffic is moving sluggishly at 32 miles per hour. You take away 12% of traffic and you can get traffic flowing at a reasonable 49 miles per hour rate. And this is just doing a modeling study. So we've addressed the issue of uh, having a convenient alternative and those 12 percent of uh, drivers have an alternative uh, to use what about however those drivers who may be low income and might not be willing or able to carp we'll have to address that issue and we might get concerns about that we might get concerns about traffic diversion if people don't want to carpool. So here's another uh, alternative uh, that we can use instead of tolling all lanes, as in the prior example, we told just two lanes. Now, since the 12% reduction in traffic is now uh, restricted to just two lanes, we get more reduction per lane and we get a, a speeds increasing to 56 miles per hour, even better than before. Of course, you would need to charge a higher toll to, to ward off induced travelers when you made such a big improvement. So here's the tolls I estimated that would be needed to ward off those induced travelers during rush hours. And the cash incentive is in the second line. And I did the calculations and I came up with a 17% net revenue if you price all lanes and 25% if you price just two lanes. So in conclusion, uh, by combining congestion pricing with incentivized on-demand ride sharing, we can address and solve the congestion problem. We can also address the issue of affordable transportation to people who have don't, no good access to uh, transit service because they work in the suburbs and not downtown. And we might even have some additional revenue to address our other transportation needs. So how do we begin? So here's a suggestion uh, that what you can do in Southern California, you've got HOV lanes, HOV twos, uh, use those lanes, but they uh, get filled up. And uh, if you want to, and, and they of course uh, move at 30 miles per hour uh, uh, on occasions. And if you want to reduce that uh, congestion, you would have to move, uh, shift the occupancy requirement 
to HOV3, that would uh, kick off all of the HOV2s into the general purpose lanes. You would have much more congestion in the regular lanes and uh, very little uh, traffic in the HOV lane, uh, and that would not be a good solution. So how can we get pricing to address this issue? Well, you charge a toll, and this is just illustrative. Uh, you know, it could be $3, $2, whatever, $1. And in uh, you provide cash incentives to HOV uh, vehicles, but it would depend on occupancy. So an HOV2, for example, would get $2, but if I'm an HOV3, I might get 6 And uh, of course, since I have to pay a toll as an HOV2, I would have a net cost of a dollar if I'm an HOV3. As a driver, I would pay the $3, but I would get a net saving or a bonus of $3, which would incentivize me to pick up a third passenger. So once we show that this can be successfully implemented technically and uh, from, with acceptance from the public, the next step is to solve congestion in the regular lane. And how would we do that? We charge a toll, nominal toll again, whatever is needed to keep the induced travelers away. We provide credits per person. And as you can see here, SOVs would get no credits. So they'd pay a dollar and everybody else in an, uh, depending on their occupancy, uh, which they would get more credits, more cash incentives, the more people they have in the car, they would uh, get uh, a net uh, bonus. And uh, so that would address the public acceptability issue and make congestion pricing feasible in Southern California. So if you want more information, uh, this idea that I'm proposing has been published in a transportation research record paper that I presented uh, in January at the Transportation Research Board. The Mineta Transportation Institute study uh, is available at uh, on its website. And you may contact me uh, if you have further questions or want to discuss, and I'm available. I do want to say that the ideas I'm proposing are my own, so they're not necessarily those of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, and of course, I'm willing to discuss with you uh, in a personal capacity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hunter, for that very fascinating look at congestion pricing. I, um, I personally very much appreciated it um, as we, as we look at this issue um, of of how do we implement a system within our, within the Inland Empire highways. And as we think about this, um, sort of just, you know, for those who are not within the, the transportation um, sort of field, thinking about SOV, single occupancy vehicles, HOV2 with two people and an HOV3 for three people within the high occupancy vehicle. So our next question here is, is the technology today able to accommodate infrastructure needs for congestion pricing? All right, so 81% um, is the technology here. And so what we're going to hear from our next speaker is new technologies that can um, help us move congestion pricing forward. And really, again, thinking about these new ways in which we can incorporate solutions to our transportation um, gridlock. I'd like to now invite um, the CEO of Shiva.ai, um, a new technology company in this space. And um, Dr. Yeni, um, I'm never going to say your name right, I'm sorry, Kochikigin. Am I close? Yes, thank you, Kimberly. Actually, that was one of the best pronunciations I have ever heard. So. Oh, you are you <laughs> kind. <laughs> It worked just fine. Uh, so thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of the uh, information about what we have been working on uh, about uh, technology part of, uh, of enabling some of those congestion charging uh, and road usage charging uh, schemes, uh, as well as tolling as another piece of this. 
I'm actually very encouraged by seeing that uh, many people do uh, believe that the technology is already out there uh, to enable congestion charging. Um, unfortunately, that is not a lot of what we see in practice uh, because there are many hurdles still available um, uh, in front of us uh, to overcome in order to make these types of solutions ubiquitous. And some of the challenges are exactly uh, what I'm going to be talking about today from the technology perspective and how we can actually make it work for uh, everyone out there. So again, uh, part of the thing that we are working on, and this is only one use case, is we're working on connected vehicle technology, uh, which is therefore infrastructure independent or other in the field uh, as compared to having you know, gantries and plazas and other types of infrastructures out there to enable some of those solutions. Uh, and it covers multiple things around in-vehicle connectivity and how we can monetize it to deliver various types of services for people and to improve some of our public services. Uh, as we look into this road usage charging and tolling um, aspects, uh, we see a lot of obviously a lot of flavors out there. Um, there is obviously conventional tolling, a lot of it being implemented with the um, uh, regular cordon-based ba uh, cordon um solution which would uh, utilize toll plazas uh, we also have congestion pricing such as in london stockholm uh, manchester tried to implement it also uh, which uh, did not quite uh, work out well a vehicle miles traveled as a solution high occupancy tolling so there are multiple flavors out there as to how we try to control traffic and try to really improve some of those uh, solutions for uh, transportation and for moving people around as well as goods um, some of the things that we have noticed is obviously a lot of states uh, are currently or have already been doing uh, various pilots and various solutions around road uses charging, including congestion pricing as one of the uh, one of the aspects of one of the flavors, as I was talking about. Um, and some of those are Oregon, Washington State, uh, Utah, California. Um, many states, especially on the West Coast, have been looking into this. Um, and I think uh, it should actually, um, uh, you know, alert us. Uh, to um, look at that, uh, the Washington state uh, legislation uh, have been passed in 2012 uh, to implement road use charging. However, we still don't see it there uh, in the state and therefore there are certain uh, aspects of that that just don't allow uh, for this to happen. Uh, first of all, there is uh, one technology uh, hurdle that is about advanced mileage reporting, right? Because one of the things that uh, we have in the United States in particular is that uh, what roads, who they belong to, is it municipal road, is it federal road, is it a private road, is it state road? Um, uh, so these are some of the things that are really critical uh, to implement and to uh, precisely charge and precisely manage the infrastructure, the road infrastructure from the perspective of the vehicle and understanding where people actually drive. Uh, the second uh, uh, issue, which is probably even more uh, important, is double taxation, which was one of the aspects that was in the first poll of the day today, uh, that uh, we're going to end up paying double uh, for the infrastructure out there. Um, and uh, one of the bigger aspects here is as uh, road usage charging, as well as you know congestion charging, again, being one of the aspects of one of the flavors of, of uh, RUC or ROC, uh, it has been... Uh, driven a lot by the electric vehicle um, deployment and um, kind of growth of that market, um, but they don't pay fuel tax. What about the internal combustion engine vehicles uh, that are still in abundance on our roads? Uh, and therefore, people are, it's very difficult to estimate what was the amount of fuel tax paid at the pump versus if we start paying for road usage. Um, and then Connected to this, what you have is what about cross-state and cross-county drivers, right? Because uh, the issue that, for example, one, exam one example that uh, typically being, uh, being brought up is uh, Illinois has a pretty high fuel tax. So most of the truck drivers would fuel in Indiana, and then they will cross all through Illinois without paying any tax. Essentially, that would otherwise be going towards uh, road infrastructure uh, because they, um, they, they, they um, fueled in Indiana where it's just cheaper. Uh, because of that uh, lower tax there. Um, so all of these aspects are really difficult, uh, but the most difficult of this probably is a double taxation issue, which is how do we actually charge people so that we don't overcharge them? Um, and that is one of the reasons why in a state like Washington, which is very liberal and very anti-tax, 
uh, really promoting some of those solutions is very hard because people are starting to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm already paying for something. Why, why the heck do you want me to charge more? Uh, which was also the same sentiment in London when congestion charging scheme actually was integrated. And most people are saying, I'm already buying one of the uh, most expensive devices in the world, which is a car. I'm already paying for fuel. Uh, why should I also be paying for actually driving it, <laughs> getting into the city center out there in London? Uh, so this is a sentiment that is very often being brought up by many drivers in multiple countries. And that is something that we should uh, obviously consider. So one of the things where we are trying to resolve some of those aspects is uh, really looking into the vehicle as a solution here. So not relying on infrastructure per se, but looking at the vehicle. And uh, where current connected vehicle solutions fall short is that um, if, for example, um, California wanted to access some of that data, it would be not easy uh, because OEMs, auto manufacturers control many of those data flows. Uh, they do not allow easy access to them. There is no way to really utilize and streamline some of those infrastructures, digital infrastructures, to actually enable some of those solutions. Um, and then uh, what, um, uh, what happens next is uh, uh, essentially what we are working on is really streamlining, creating this one API uh, that can uh, go directly into the service provider apps or service provider architecture so that there is no need for any extra architectures to be built to access the data from the vehicle for the purpose of delivering the services, for the purpose of taxation, for the purposes of really understanding where the vehicle is driving, um, how they're getting through the roads, which road they're driving on, uh, and especially trying to add more validated services on top of this, which is say automatic fueling. You arrive by the gas pump, you stop there, we just activate the gas pump, the payment method is already connected to your single account. Um, the same about parking, the same about uh, EV charging for electric vehicles, uh, the same about retail drive and so on and so forth. Uh, so really kind of the, the, the picture here of, what, of how we see it from kind of the philosophy, the technology philosophy here. And I don't want to just say Shiva is the only enabler. Actually, there are multiple companies out there that are trying to utilize some of the telematics data and they have participated such as uh, Automatic have had their own OBD2 devices and obviously OEMs are doing a lot of work. Uh, but the point being is really, we need this accuracy up to the individual pump up to the parking spot level so that we can actually deliver those automatic payments uh, for services and provide this precise last mile navigation. Because if we just say, okay, there is another mechanism for, for us to tax you, uh, then it will be really hard to push people to utilize some of the technological solutions that we offer to them. Uh, but rather we need to really look how we improve their lives and congestion charging or other types of taxes being part of it rather than the sole purpose of it, of any type of mechanisms that we're, uh, imp uh, that we're imposing on people. So this is just a um, comparison, real quick comparison here between um, why it is important to get up to the toll lane accuracy uh, to actually enable some of those solutions because it's sometimes on a smartphone or in standard GPS, it will not even distinguish that there are two parallel roads. And maybe many of us actually experience this by using Google Maps for navigation where uh, you miss an exit and it takes a couple of minutes before Google actually realizes that you missed it. And that's the issue with smartphone location is just not accurate and uh, Google does not have access to understand quickly that, oh, you missed, you missed that turn. Uh, now I need to reroute you uh, for a different navigation instruction. Uh, so this is um, a schematic of how this type of system can work. Um, and uh, it is infrastructure independent. So again, one of the, and this is only one type of solution that we can discuss for enabling congestion charging from technology perspective. Uh, but it is not based on RFID, not based on any type of expensive infrastructure, but rather based on ALPR. So essentially, if you can enable things from the vehicle itself, if you can do this rock solutions or congestion charging solutions from the vehicle itself, then all you need to do is just random kind of spot, spot uh, uh, check um, um, enforcement, uh, which can be done with video cameras randomly distributed, such as we do speed cameras, right? Uh, we don't have speed cameras all over the place. We actually have them in specific locations. Um, and then at the same time, you utilize, like Washington State is thinking of doing it, a state patrol, uh, so actually police, um, they can also check the license plate uh, pretty quickly on patrol uh, and see if there is a delinquency of, on certain payments around uh, congestion charging or rock or any other types of um, um, unpaid, uh, uh, unpaid bills. 
Um, super easy to use and integrate when we talk about our particular solution, which is just based on one API, uh, which can be delivered directly into existing uh, types of architectures out there. It's just a plug and play API, no architectural changes, all those use cases and templates are being built in. Uh, one of the things that we noticed from the state agencies where we are enabling them to really create this architecture, uh, the digital architecture, uh, is that they want to be agnostic, right? They want to be field application agnostic, they want to be system integrator agnostic. Um, and obviously, which is where uh, companies like HNTB are so well positioned because uh, there is already a lot of experience behind this and there is a lot of kind of competitive market advantages in what HNTB and companies like that have, have built. Uh, but then the piece here is that, okay, why don't we allow multiple field applications out there to enable these different types of solutions uh, to be available? Uh, all of this then feeds into the sync car payments, anti-fraud integration, really direct digital wallet solution, turning your vehicle into the payment method by itself. Uh, this is just a quick example of what we've done with the automotive company uh, to integrate directly on board the vehicle. Uh, this is just more of an example of how GPS is really bad uh, in many locations, including urban canyons. So white dots you see here is raw GPS. Blue line is how uh, like closer to ground truth, which can be delivered with certain algorithms like the one that uh, we have on board the vehicle. Uh, and then obviously a lot of this is driven by post COVID normal, right? Because 82% of people want contactless payments. They don't want to touch on every kind of drive through. They don't want to touch on a fuel on the gas pump. Uh, they want to reduce human interaction. They want to, to do increased engagement from the perspective of a service provider. Uh, and that is what it delivers. With a longer term vision here is really a handoff because if you enable a vehicle as a payment method, then you arrive at the park and ride facility and then you hand off uh, to go on train. Uh, one example I usually like is Mount Vernon in New York where we had some uh, initial uh, engagement. Uh, it's a, it's right next to Yonkers, uh, um, um, right on the verge of kind of train, the Grand Central. So people would be driving using tolls uh, to get there. They would have to park there then they'll take trains and go down to Grand Central and then they still can have a, a they, they have to take a subway to get to their final destination. So this whole journey of multimodal transportation is what needs to be enabled. Uh, and one of the things is really to make a handoff uh, of the payment method between the vehicle and multiple other kind of mobile phones, uh, you know, oyster, oyster type cards and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's in short what uh, I wanted to share today from the perspective of kind of how we can enable some of those congestion pricing from the technology perspective without much infrastructure investment, really. Wow, thank you very much for that. Uh, a really quick overview of, of all of the technologies, but man, that, that presentation so fast had a lot of really important information for us to discuss. And I have a ton of questions, but I think, um, for us to get started. Please, if you have questions, remember to write them down and, and get them ready for our conversation at the end. Um, Will, it looks like you have something you you, you really want to reflect yeah, on but, for a second. Well, yeah, at least yeah. the poll question for us. Yeah, this, I, I thought that was a very interesting presentation. I, I thought I was very interested to see the, the three different kind of challenges, of, with challenges with road user charges. And I think there should be a fourth added to that list of NG, and that's how do we scale congestion pricing? And you, you made reference to, you know, the investment in infrastructure and the time it takes to deploy traditional tolling systems. So I'm, I'm really encouraged to see that there are technologies that are emerging that will help us scale congestion pricing more quickly and hopefully more efficiently so that we can we can deliver congestion relief uh, in a more immediate timelines than, than perhaps the way we have traditionally. So great presentation. So our next question for you is how should the revenues be used that are generated from congestion pricing? We've had a, we've had a proposal on the table from Patrick. Um, we have a solution on how to collect the monies from Yanni. And then, but how should we use those funds? What is the best way um, to go forward? Is it with transit, um, public works projects, non-transportation related projects or other? And then if you do answer other, if you're willing to share with us what your other might be, that would be great as well. So as people answer, I just wanted to just highlight one piece of your presentation, and that was sort of the integration and mobility as a service, thinking on your last slide and how you have just one app to integrate all of the different services, uh, transportation options that are out there 
if you were able to join us in um, our last dialogue, we had Dan Sperling here from the um, Institute of Transportation from UC Davis. And he really talked about the importance of giving people options within your transportation system. And one of the challenges I see within the Inland Empire is just that. What are all of our, our real, you know, our real options for getting from point A to point B and then on to point C, whatever that might be. So um, thinking about mobility as a service and providing a multitude of options so it works for everyone who's within the community, um, it seems like your app would be part of that. Am I, am I wrong or am I, I don't know. You're absolutely right. Actually, uh, Kimberly, just to add to this, uh, there's a lot of work uh, being done as I'm part of this ISO TC204 committee that has a working group 19. Um, and actually, Dick Schnacke is the chairman of that technical committee that is about intelligent transport systems. So the working group 19 is exactly about integrated mobility uh, system standards. Uh, that is convened by Norway, but there is a lot of thinking going on globally uh, exactly about that topic. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy to actually activate it in practice because many people just cannot think more than two modes in their one journey. It's just, you know, humans are that. <laughs> so there are certain limitations about us as biological machines, but, uh, but obviously there is a lot of thinking uh, and, uh, and uh, discussion uh, being around this topic. Thank you for raising that. All right, thank you. And we see here that some of the the revenues used should go towards transit. Um, so good news for our friends at Omnitrans and Foothill Transit, but really thinking about the importance of transit within the overall piece of, of or the overall selection of options that are out there in thinking about our, 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 our system as a whole. Um, with that, I'd like to invite up our next speaker, um, Tam Yin from LA Metro, and they, she's been doing a tremendous amount of work over there in the LA area about congestion pricing and some of the solutions that it can provide. Tam, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kimberly. Well, uh, good morning. My name is Tam Nguyen. I'm a senior director at LA Metro in uh, the Office of Extraordinary Innovation. And since 2019, late 2019, we have been embarking on a study looking at the use of congestion pricing to manage uh, traffic, as well as provide additional high quality options for people to get around. And so this initiative stems from Metro's 10 year strategic plan, which is Vision 2028, looking at how do we deliver a mobility system that enables people to travel swiftly, easily throughout the LA County region, uh, no matter where they wanna go, when they wanna travel. And obviously uh, that is a big vision in terms of, uh, in terms of mobility. Uh, and we recognize that this is just uh, congestion pricing is one of multiple strategies that we will have to leverage and think about more comprehensively uh, and that there are multiple services programs and that our portfolio really needs to look at how do we deliver service uh, in a way that uh, can provide people with more options for seamless travel. And so uh, this is a scene that if you're familiar with LA County uh, or even maybe in your, your neck of the woods as well, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a congested area. We're probably, uh, a lot of us are pretty familiar with it. Uh, and during the pandemic, we had a bit of a reprieve from traffic, but it's coming back full force. And we anticipate that it's going to get worse as population uh, rebounds, as the economy rebounds. And so with that, uh, we recognize and we, we actually start with the premise for, uh, of our study that, uh, that we have a very inequitable transportation system now. Uh, those who uh, have the means to travel, they, they do and they, they drive. Uh, those who uh, don't have the means to own a car uh, are relegated to transportation options that may or may not work very well for them if they're uh, taking the bus, this, the bus is stuck in traffic. And so uh, right now our system doesn't work for a lot of people. And over the years, we've tried to do a lot of things to improve it, but we can't keep up with the pace of demand on our roadway system. And there are a lot of consequences, serious consequences to traffic congestion uh, that actually disproportionately affects low income and vulnerable populations from air pollution that affects uh, uh, health to uh, the, the cost of uh, monetary costs of 
driving or the cost of transportation uh, for for low income uh, households. That's actually a larger, substantial amount of their um, household budget dedicated to transportation. Uh, the pro productivity in terms of the time that people lose in traffic and the freedom to be able to travel where they uh, want to go when they want to to go. And even climate change and uh, carbon emissions are all things that have serious uh, are, are uh, seriously affected by congestion and traffic. And so with that, our study is looking at uh, getting to a pilot program that uh, includes the use of congestion pricing to manage traffic as well as provide additional transportation options. And we're looking at uh, in the LA region, is it feasible to try this somewhere where there's a lot of congestion in the county? Uh, where and how could it work? And are there willing partners to explore this with us further? Uh, the, at LA Metro, we do not control a lot of the roadway network. Uh, that really uh, is the jurisdiction of our municipalities. And so having willing uh, city partners, municipalities who are willing to explore this with us uh, are really critical. But then on top of that, just having public and stakeholder support uh, and a regional uh, coalition of people who are willing to explore this is really critical because uh, congestion pricing, uh, one of the key uh, reasons that the, the models that we're exploring right now have not been implemented uh, over the past decades is not a technical issue. You've already heard examples uh, from speakers uh, today about how it's been implemented across the world. The reason that it has not been implemented to this scale is a political stakeholder buying issue, not a technical issue. And so with that, we want to look at, well, where's their willing partners to explore this idea with us further? And how do we build that coalition of supporters? So uh, ultimately, the goal of a pilot program is, as I mentioned, to reduce traffic congestion uh, through congestion pricing and providing more high quality options. But in addition, we're striving for additional positive outcomes in terms of improving public health and safety, uh, such as uh, uh, improvements to air quality, improvements to roadway safety, as well as supporting environmental and economic justice, uh, uh, including uh, supporting uh, the state's climate goals and uh, improving and supporting the economy in terms of providing more access to opportunities, making the system work better and more effectively. And um, uh, for a lot of programs that we've seen across the world, we know that there is probably uh, some revenues that are gonna be generated and we wanna look at how do we reinvest those net revenues back into the communities that are served or affected by a pilot program. So equity comes up in almost every conversation we've had. And we've had lots of conversations over the past year. And so it is something that we think about a lot in terms of the study and uh, how uh, the lens through which we look at the study. And so as part of our process, um, we uh, identify who's going to be impacted, how are they going to be impacted, uh, what is the desired outcome, and how do we measure progress and success? Uh, what are the, uh, how do we measure potential benefits and burdens uh, to different populations, especially vulnerable and low-income communities? And we develop strategies to address the burdens, uh, to increase the benefits, and this could include providing, for example, subsidies or low-income uh, assistance programs for those who may uh, may not be able to pay the fee but need to drive. Uh, and also looking at reinvestments of net revenues is critical in terms of um, also uh, thinking about what is the proposed package of transportation improvements that would accompany any pilot program and any fee. And then uh, we are looking at how we can uh, uh, work with communities to circulate, refine any pilot concept that we come up with because it really needs to work for the context uh, of the community. And so, as I mentioned, better options, certainly part of the solution and part of the study. And so uh, we are looking at, for example, the package of transportation improvements could include uh, uh, increased uh, bus and rail service, uh, better uh, walking and bicycling conditions, uh, increased incentives for telecommuting uh, or carpooling. Uh, this is just an example. We certainly need to work with communities to figure out what's the right package and mix of transportation improvements. And so uh, we started looking at where in LA County could uh, we explore this uh, identified concepts for further analysis. And so it's a big county. Uh, and so we looked at uh, uh, some criteria for how we identify those concepts for further analysis. First looking at, well, uh, 
uh, where in the county is their ability to use congestion pricing to substantially reduce uh, traffic congestion? Uh, are the traffic uh, reduction benefits easy to describe to the public? Uh, and uh, are there potential interested jurisdictions who want to explore this with us further? Uh, is there potential for rich transit and mobility options that we can implement before a pilot program is launched? Uh, and then uh, are there potential to anticipate and minimize spillover traffic? Uh, and uh, from our European and Asian neighbors uh, who have deployed congestion pricing programs before, we also learned uh, best practices from them. And what we what we learned is to the greatest extent possible, use natural or human made structures as boundaries, because if you have too much porosity in certain areas where it's just really hard to manage access, that becomes really difficult uh, to to uh, uh, to implement. And so when people enter a congestion price area, they should know that they're in that area and that it's being priced. And so mountains, water bodies, uh, uh, freeways are uh, good, uh, good boundaries if possible. And then also to focus on commercial locations where you have the ability to influence uh, the types of trips and uh, can use uh, pricing to influence that, those trips and to avoid bisecting neighborhoods and communities. And so with that, we also looked at, well, where's congestion occurring in LA County? And so the red that you see is where uh, uh, the, the worst traffic is occurring. This is pre-COVID data, but it looks at uh, where uh, during uh, peak periods of congestion, your trip takes twice as long to get to where you need to go. So as you can see, lots of red, lots of places uh, throughout uh, the region. So I'm not actually going to show you where the locations are, but I'll just say that we have four concepts that we're exploring further just for the sake of time. And uh, I'll uh, give you more information if you're interested in, uh, in the website where you can look at the, the maps of where those congestion price areas are. Uh, we are also looking at, well, what's the price? What's the uh, appropriate pricing model to achieve our objectives? And so we are looking at uh, corridor pricing, which is uh, we have a version of that in LA County already. That's our express lane program. Uh, now looking at pricing, uh, taking that to uh, the next level, pricing all lanes on a freeway or pricing adjacent uh, roadways or, or ramps. Uh, with cordon pricing, we would look at uh, pricing, uh, uh, creating a boundary around a central area and charging vehicles that cross that boundary or some sort of hybrid system. And as my uh, the other speakers before me have uh, indicated, pricing to manage demand does work with measurable improvements in terms of congestion, air quality improvements, emissions, mode shift. Uh, these are examples from London, Stockholm, as well as the SR520 in Seattle. And uh, public, and just to also to mention that public support over time, once people have actually seen the the programs implemented and seen its effects. Uh, public uh, support for those programs have uh, increased over time. And so I mentioned we have been having a lot of conversations uh, over the past year with uh, a lot of different stakeholders and we received a lot of feedback. Uh, and so uh, these are just examples of uh, the types of feedback and the types of questions we receive in terms of if, uh, if you're a driver, how are you going to uh, what are the benefits that you're going to get back from it to uh, the super commuters who are are uh, need to make long distance trips as part of uh, their commute and how are they going to be affected uh, to those who are concerned about spillover traffic uh, in their neighborhood from a pricing a program like this to those who actually see the potential opportunity to uh, address air pollution and carbon emissions reductions uh, with a program like this and so lots of uh, uh, lots of feedback we received. And one of the things that we're doing is looking at how can we incorporate that into our technical analysis. And so these are just uh, some categories of how we're thinking about success. What does success look like and how do we measure it? Are we actually improving mobility by reducing roadway congestion and improving uh, how uh, people travel. Are we improving uh, access to opportunity and reducing travel time by different modes? Uh, are we improving uh, the, the number of jobs that people can access? Uh, are we uh, improving mode share to transit or uh, walking, bicycling, other modes of transportation? 
Uh, have we reduced the vehicle miles traveled and uh, improved air quality? Uh, what is the household burden uh, budget that people would actually use towards uh, transportation? And how are different households, uh, uh, different households of different varying uh, incomes affected by it? How are our low income households affected by, uh, by this and how affordable is it to them? And what is the cost of a system like this, as well as the potential net revenues that could be reinvested uh, into the communities? Uh, all the things that we are, are going, that's going to be unfolding over the, the next uh, year as we uh, continue uh, to, to uh, uh, analyze this further. And so in terms of next steps, we are, uh, we, we are getting ready for our third round of public uh, and stakeholder engagement. We are uh, doing our, our uh, we have conducted our initial uh, analysis and modeling. And so we are buried in a mountain of data right now that we're going to sift through. And uh, we're gonna be sharing that information in terms of the initial technical analysis and conducting, as I mentioned, the next round of, of uh, engagement where we're trying to get feedback in terms of how do we prioritize all of these different metrics, the outcomes, and how do we uh, make trade-offs in terms of all of these different factors. Uh, we're gonna be identifying uh, through input from uh, our stakeholders, strategies to address impacts to low-income and vulnerable communities. Uh, we'll be working to uh, with them to identify uh, what is the uh, reinvestment of net revenues uh, what, what types of investments, what are the types of mobility improvements uh, that uh, we should consider to address burdens and to increase benefits, and what are the feasible concepts that we should carry to the next stage. We have four concepts right now, but we want to narrow it down to less than four for the next stage of the study. And so all of this feedback then informs our equity analysis, our income analysis, the development of our, our financial plan, uh, as well as uh, uh, the transportation improvements. Uh, uh, we're gonna rerun our model with the input from uh, this round of stakeholder public engagement and further refine our analysis. So this is the schedule of where we are. Uh, the study, as I mentioned, started in 2019. We anticipate that by spring of 2022, the study will be complete. We will be bringing to our Metro Board of Directors an implementation plan. At that point, they can decide whether they want to proceed with the next phase or if they want to stop the study there. And if they decide that they want to move it forward, there's still uh, a lot of things that need to occur in terms of doing environmental clearance, uh, getting state and federal approval, um, designing the system and making sure that the roadway and transit improvements are implemented before we layer on the pricing element. And so we anticipate that if everything works out, uh, the pilot program would launch in 2025. And by then, hopefully the pandemic would be long behind us, population and uh, the economy would rebound, and that we would be uh, looking at uh, a very gridlocked future if we don't start addressing and planning for a better future, a uh, mobility future now. And so, you know, um, People, you know, just just to wrap this up in terms of why are we doing the study overall? It's really to look at well, what is an alternative future where we're not stuck in gridlock could look like? What what would be the ideal outcome of this? And ultimately, we hope that through this, uh, we are providing people with better uh, travel options where they can swiftly, easily uh, uh, travel. And however uh, they choose to travel, whether they want to drive, they want to take transit, they want to uh, move uh, and deliver goods, uh, that they have better options to do so and that they have a better experience in doing uh, that. And that they have a variety of safe uh, and reliable options for getting to where they need to go. Uh, they have better access to more jobs and opportunities and uh, that they, they have more time to spend on things that really matter to them instead of being stuck in gridlock and ultimately to have cleaner air and uh, lower uh, carbon emissions. And so ultimately, that is our hope for the future, an alternative future that is, uh, is, uh, has better mobility for everyone. So this is my contact information, and hopefully, um, uh, there, uh, uh, you know, on a personal note, uh, my mobility future is I hope that uh, I have a lot of options to choose from, and that my trip isn't relegated to one mode or another, but that it has uh, a lot of uh, options for me to choose from for the types of trips that I want to make uh, when I want to make it. And I hope that the same for you as well.
<laughs> so with that, I will uh, stop sharing. Thank you so much, Tam. That is a, um, a great presentation and really brings to mind for me, um, you know, what will be the impact for us in living in the Inland Empire? Of course, there's that center, um, but many of us travel along those freeways that you show. I was just on a lot of that red on the 210. As you say, traffic mm -hmm. is coming back. Um, so really thinking about the, the impacts to the Inland Empire on these, on these um, initiatives and to all of my students that are out there, because I know a number of my students from my, my two classes that I'm teaching this summer are in, are in our session right now, to really think about um, this from that policy perspective and the impacts that will occur not only for that center area within the LA basin, but also these periphery areas. Um, the, those of us who travel into different sites throughout the LA, um, the LA Metro to you know, work or, or you know, uh, culture, other different types of, 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 of experiences that we look for. Um, so really that, those impacts for us as well. And maybe we could address that a bit more within our, within our time of our, our question and answering. Um, and I know that there's a number of individuals as well in the room that could help us with that. So um, Kathleen, you wanna move us on to our, one of our last questions in our Zoom poll before we move on. So these were semi-addressed and this is kind of a softball question out there for you just to kind of think about all of the impacts that that traffic congestion um, does to us. So what do you think are the factors that should be included in the true cost of your commute? So we have gas and time, which many times that's what we naturally think about. But then we also have to add in the vehicle costs, so the wear and tear on your vehicle. Um, there's the cost of the infrastructure itself for us to drive on. And many times, again, we think about that comes from our gas taxes, as well as other taxes that we pay within the system. Um, but then there's also environmental impacts as we look at sort of our changing world and the impacts of climate change and the discussions of fires and, and um, you know, how do we become more resilient within these changing times? And then really thinking about finally, the mental and physical health costs that come with traffic congestion that have been studied and not really um, you know, fully addressed here, but something that, that has been implied that there are these other costs that happen to our, our physical and our mental health. And then finally, we have an other for you. Um, so just bring that forward. Of course, you know, again, a softball question, really thinking about um, all of the impacts that can happen to us as we look at um, congestion. And, and so how do we make our lives better? That's one of the main things, one of the main pieces, again, that I always share with my students as well. You know, government is there um, working with business and working through a cooperative federalist system to help make people's lives better. So um, let's turn it over to our final and um, our final speaker for today before we open it up to full discussion, um, Gary Coho. And I'm remiss to say all of our speakers' bios are on the program as well as the LTC website. If you'd like to read more about them, I just didn't take the time. Um, I'd like to hear from them first. So Gary, please. Okay, good morning. I'm Gary Coho. I'm working on the I-10 project with Will right now. I to just let you know, I did retire from SBC Day or Sandbag almost four years ago now. So I have not been involved in a lot of the policy discussions that are going on in that agency right now. What I'm gonna show you here today, again, is on the 10 and 15 corridor project, the two that have been approved to move forward with express lanes. But talk about some of the information that we shared to get to their approval and to move forward with the projects. First here is the population to population growth of San Bernardino County. But I should mention too, some of the information is dated since I haven't made this presentation for, as I said, almost four years now, um, but I think still it's relevant. So again, the growth of the county is projected to be up to 3.433 million, which is an increase of 68%. Again, that's one of the things we've got to deal with is how do you accommodate all these additional people on our transportation system? Do you build more lanes? Just keep building lanes, free lanes like we have been doing. 
he manages the system better, you do a combination of both. We have the increased traffic demand, which I talked about. We have the right-of-way constraints. On the 10 and 15 corridor, for a lot of it, we'd only add two more lanes um, just because of constraint right away without taking a lot of the, a lot of uh, private development being both commercial and residential. So to minimize that, we have to figure out a better way to use our facilities we have. And then there's limited funding, even with the um, increase in gas tax, we still are below historical need for that because the vehicle miles traveled is increasing a lot faster than what the uh, the transportation revenue is, is um, increasing by. So we have to do more with less funding. So we need to optimize our facilities. We can't build our way out of congestion. There's two ways for managed lanes. One we just, we've all seen is the HOV lanes. It's just managed by occupancy restrictions. It's gotta be two plus or three plus to um, use the lanes. And the other one it goes to express lanes where you have occupancy restrictions and pricing. When we first start taking this out to the public, discuss uh, express lanes, we showed them these engineering curves, which is a speed versus flow curve. And it's, what I've just shown people is that once you hit capacity, which is the uh, end of the peak here, then your, your, um, your capacity per lane starts dropping. So the number of vehicles you can get through on a lane starts dropping. But people looked at this stuff, not being engineers, and looked at this kind of cross-eyed and said, what, what are you talking about? So what we did, we actually took a video of the 91 freeway here and we'd ask people, give us your thoughts on what you're seeing in this video. And they say the, uh, the four free lanes, the ones on the right, they're carrying a lot of traffic and the ones on the left are being underutilized. At the same time as you took this video, we got the traffic counts. There it's showing number of vehicles per lane. So the two express lanes on the left are carrying as much traffic as the four general purpose lanes on the right, uh, running under those um, congested conditions. So with that, people can understand what we're trying to do with, as far as managing lanes. So the express lanes have two main purposes. One is to manage traffic. And of course, the other one is to generate revenue to um, fund these needed improvements. So these are some of the benefits of express lanes, manage traffic, generates revenue, but it also promotes carpooling. Carpooling is part of express lanes. Like on the 10 um, quarter, if you're three plus, you get a discounted rate on there or to actually travel for free. It improves air quality because you don't have congestion with people sitting there idling. It provides a reliable trip time. So if people have to get where within a certain time, they have an option to get in there and um, make that trip on time because the, um, the tolls are um, changed to make sure that the traffic is moving. And there's a synergy with transit. We've been, while we were doing this, we we're talking to Omnitrans and they were very interested in using the express lanes because they could run their express bus down there and make sure that they're going to get there on the right time to stay on schedule. Some of the um, cons or concerns of, it, of uh, express lanes is they're Lexus lanes, um, but equity studies have found that there's benefits for the low income because the drive times in the general purpose lanes are better because people go over to express lanes, reducing the amount of demand for the general purpose lanes. And they have a travel option to make someplace on time if they need to, like if they're late for work and they need to get there or they're gonna be consequences, they can use those lanes to get there. They don't have to use them all the time. They're paying twice is another one we heard but again, the transportation revenue to fund the needed improvements is not there, can't fund at all. Um, so we need this additional revenue and we are adding lanes. We're not just converting lanes. Discouraging carpooling. As I said, carpooling is part of the express lane um, policies. If you carpool, you get to travel in the lanes for free. And then there's a misery index in the general purpose lanes that the people in general purpose lanes will be suffering while people that can afford it are going um, making their trip on time in the express lanes. But because again, you're taking traffic from the general purpose lanes over to the express lanes, the people in general purpose lanes are um, 
experience experience and a benefit also. And I have some more information on that on that that I'll share with you in a minute. This is just some of the studies that were done on the I-15 down in San Diego as far as approval. The one on the uh, the left is the fast track customers, and they approve 88 percent on you using express lanes or even building more express lanes. But you see on the the right, that's people in the general purpose lanes and their approval rate is 66%. Again, because they've seen a benefit to them because their congestion is not as bad and their commute times improve. They looked at that also across the different ages, ethnicity and incomes. And you can see that they're all fairly equal as far as um, approval of the express lanes. So here in um, San Bernardino County, we're looking at two routes for the express lanes. They've actually been approved through an environmental process and moving forward as far as the SBC board proven to move forward with them. The first one being the I-10, which goes from LA County line to Ford Street in Redlands, a distance of 33 miles, which in current dollars has a cost of about $2.2 billion. The first part that's being design and is, is now under construction is from the LA County line to the 15 freeway. On the I-15, it goes from the SR-60 up into Victorville in the high desert, a distance, a distance of approximately 35 miles and a current estimated cost about 2.6 billion. On the 15, one will tie into the Riverside County express lane project that is just being completed that runs from the SR-91 up to the 60 freeway. And there'll be access on the both these quarters, the 10 and the 15, about every three to four miles. So again, it was designed to serve the communities, not just to push people through the communities. So they've accessed and it'll be a benefit to the communities that abut these two quarters. The um, express lane alternative on both these quarters is two express lanes, four general purpose lanes and auxiliary lanes uh, at some locations. There's a few spots where there will just be a single express lane. That's of course is near the terminus of these lanes where you start dropping your lanes to tie back into existing. The, um, as I said, there's gonna be ingress every three or four miles. And this is just a concept of it. What's being constructed is there will be a lane to weave in. So we don't try to minimize the impact of the general purpose lane as cars are entering and exiting the uh, express lane. From our modeling, we uh, took a look at what the travel times would be if you build, build no additional lanes, if you added just an HOV lane, again, from the LA County line to Redlands, or with the express lane. And you can see here that for the I-10 westbound AM, it's 110 minutes to make that a commute if you did nothing here in the year 2030. It goes down to 62 minutes if you had an X, um, HOV lane and goes to 46 minutes with the express lanes. And you can see the similar information for going um, the eastbound direction in the PM. It goes from 168 minutes down to 53 minutes. Again, this is the travel times in the general purpose lane. The similar study for the 15, going from the 60 up to Route 395, which is up in the Victorville area. And you see here again, southbound AM, 104 minutes down to 39 and 168 minutes down to 73. There was no HOV alternative for the I-15. And the, um, these two projects, of course, are part of both the Skag RTP regional network. There's, this here shows where there's planned express lanes within the Skag region, the Southern California region with the uh, first ones being in operation being the SR-91 and the I-10 and I-110 in LA County. That's option. That's the end of my presentation. Again, as I said, I'm no longer involved in the policy discussions at SBCTA. Now I'm constructing one of them, so. <laughs> thanks so much, Gary, for that. And thanks for making those connections for us with um, with L.A. So many, many uh, questions have come up for me. And there's some questions already here as we 
do our last polling question and then we'll jump right into our conversation. So just to regage, starting with our first question again, um, you know, is congestion pricing the solution we're worth looking for? So let's just see if there is any other thoughts in the room after our four really great presentations. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers for really staying on time and, and seeing that we are right on schedule um, so that we have enough time for our conversation, which is the greatest part of this dialogue is to have that conversation. So I hope you're getting ready your, your different questions and your ideas to bring them forward, really thinking about what you learned, um, what you didn't hear possibly, and how do we move this conversation forward? Okay, a bit of a change there. We still have a number of maybes out there, but um, many more yeses and still some people who think that no, it is not part of our, of our options. So with that, um, <clears throat> I'd like to just look here um, from, from Will Allen. We have, I'd like to hear more about the equity performance measures noted in your presentation and which are you prioritizing based on stakeholder feedback received thus far? I think that question would be for Tam, is it not for Will? Is it not Will? I would like to, Tam, yeah, if that's you right. bring that forward for us. So some of the equity performance issues that you had. Uh, so, uh Regarding the equity performance, um, so uh, we are still exploring that further in terms of how we prioritize. From a technical perspective, we can, you know, probably rank them technically, but really, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, that's that's just data. And where it really becomes important is how do we, what are the policy implications behind uh, those metrics that I mentioned that uh, that. Uh, different communities care about and how do we prioritize those and that really requires a conversation. We have actually equity focused conversations where we bring a lot of different stakeholders around the table to to talk about those things and so we're going to be holding a third one where we share with them the, the results um, uh, over the summer and actually get their feedback on it. But in terms of equity, so th there are several uh, ways where we are looking at the data in terms of being able to divide it up into different uh, income, uh, household income uh, spectrums. And then from there, we can actually get a better sense of like for these different household uh, incomes, uh, how are they, uh, how has access to jobs increased? or decrease, um, how has travel time changed for them, as well as how has um, air quality, air pollution uh, changed for those uh, communities. In the LA County area, we have what are uh, what at LA Metro we call equity focused communities. So these are communities that uh, have limited access to vehicles, have low income and uh, non-white household and so we look at it through the lens of how are those communities going to be affected by a pilot program like this i'm glad to share uh, more of that uh, i have a report that i can uh, share uh, afterwards all right thank you tim um will do you have any follow-up to that or any no th thanks for the, the response tam i think you know i'm glad to see you're looking at factors, <clears throat> excuse me, beyond just income and looking at other factors like access to jobs and mm -hmm. uh, maybe even considering things like, uh, you know, things like language, how, how easily understood is a congestion pricing to those who don't English isn't their first language. So um, glad to hear you're, you're considering many different metrics and I'd be happy to talk more with you about that separate from this meeting. That's great. And I think you make a good point, Will, just how, how understandable is congestion pricing for those who, who do speak English. I mean, I think there's a, uh, an issue um, in understanding what does it mean and how does it really function um, because of the technical aspects behind it. And also just the communication with the public on, on how to use the toll roads. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we get that information out? I think should be a big part of the conversation because it can be confusing um, depending on which road you're on and which provider 
is there. So it, 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 it's a, you know, many times there's so many options, it's very difficult to be able to manage all those as a user. As, um, as Eugenie shared with us, most, you know, uh, commuters can only really think about those two people, those two options of, of, of travel. So, um, you know, how do we, how do we get that word across and make sure that people understand what they're using and, and how to use it itself. So, um, the next question we have, um, I think is really pushing uh, or, or directed towards Gary. Um, if more people use the express lanes, won't they eventually become just as congested as the free lanes? And that came from my good friend and colleague, Victoria Seitz. So the, the um, again, the other way to manage the traffic on express lanes is by the toll rate. So on the I-10 and I-15, they're looking at a flexible, a variable toll rate system where it's actually measuring the congestion in the I in the general purpose lanes and and in the express lanes. And as the express lanes get more congested, they're not hit the 45 mile an hour speed that we're trying to achieve, the toll rates go up. And so it's a variable variable system that runs off an algorithm. So it changes every few minutes based on the demand of traffic. It's not like it's on the 91 right now where they actually have a fixed time base where, again, it's based on what they project as traffic, but it's set for certain periods of time. On the 10 and 15, it will be, um, it'll be adjusted based on what the traffic is actually doing out in the field on the site. Well, <clears throat> given that, you know, then we get to the equity issue again. I think that Will brought up is that the price goes up to like 110, I think, during um, and they do this in Washington DC to ride the metro they have the the rush hour rate and, and that so sure we can ride the express lanes the only reason I don't use them um, but you know I've driven along them like on the 91 and um, and I've seen rarely rarely but I've seen them bunch up a bit on the express lanes but uh, you know I I that also brings up something. If you have a lot of traffic on the express lanes, I mean, because you know, there's you're going to have to up the price over time because of inflation, and more people have access and pay for it. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh well, <laughs> it's just one of those days. <laughs> very, very interesting. I just, um, it's almost a cat and mouse thing, but. Uh, Interesting, thank you. Yeah, I think one of the complexities though is thinking about it as a, um, as a user, um, you know, how do you make those, how do we help people make those calculations on, on what the true costs are? And there is the, the, the pricing um, that, that changes to help give people incentives to use the express lanes or not, um, but still it's, it's that, I kind of use them to gauge how much traffic I'm driving into. Um, well, this is this. I just remembered what I was doing. You know, you yeah. you lose a thought, thought, and you then you catch it again. So, yeah. so what about the drivers that use the express lane that are expecting to get to work in a certain time frame based on this pricing and all this stuff? They're paying a lot extra, and they don't get it. So they go to they're they're late to work or something, or it takes double the time. And, you know, because you've implemented all these measures based on algorithms, if they don't make it to work, isn't there a potential for lawsuits or, you know, problems? Well, I don't think there's a potential for a lawsuit. I mean, I've seen that back in Florida using their, their express system, express roads. But um, I've known that some of the agencies out here in Southern California, they're like, there's an accident in the express lanes and people are delayed because of that, that they actually refund their toll, which I guess compared to being getting uh, compared to being late to work might not be much, but there is some refund policies. Thank you. All right. Um, our next item in the in the in the chat box is, and it's 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 very um, true that as Sanji Nanda says for us, um, congestion pricing is a solution if you account for equity via incentives, in my opinion. For example, the ride pooling incentive is outlined um, by Patrick for the system. Um, Patrick, do you have any comments on sort of the thoughts of what you've heard and as well as 
as thinking about re, you know reactions to the equity question. Well, I, I was pleased to see that uh, Los Angeles is uh, considering ride sharing and incentives for ride sharing. I didn't see it highlighted very much, but uh, you know, as uh, a great way to instantly uh, create an alternative mode that can make congestion pricing more acceptable since, you know, it seems like all of us agree that public acceptability is the main issue that technology uh, issues have been resolved. So if incentivizing ride sharing can solve the problem of both equity as well as public acceptability, you know, I, I would like to see it uh, considered uh, more front and center simply because of the uh, promise that it holds uh, to address the issues. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, can I add to that actually? Um, uh, so uh, at LA Metro, we actually have another program I. Uh, uh, that's uh, run out of my office. Uh, uh, that is the travel rewards program, where uh, you know, on one hand, we're looking at congestion pricing. On the other hand, we're actually looking at how do we pay people not to drive. <laughs> and so, uh, there's actually a, a number of different initiatives underway. But that is actually uh, a uh, an initiative that we're we're researching right now called uh, the travel rewards uh, program, uh, made avail available through a federal fund grant that we received. And so, that's um, underway right now, actually. So it'd be good. I mean, it's uh, it, you know, it'd be good if both sides coordinated because you know you need a carrot as well as a stick. As I as I pointed out, just having the carrot doesn't work because induced travelers come in and anything you have gained is lost right away. Uh, so on the other hand, if you have both that carrot and the stick. It's doubly, uh, you know, the, there's a synergy that makes it doubly effective. So I would strongly encourage uh, both sides of the uh, uh, Los Angeles Metro to work together uh, to think about something like, for example, the HOV lanes that are congested. You know, that would be a great location to test out whether these incentives work. I mean, you know, there have been a couple of pilots and uh, just six months, not long term. And, uh, you know, we need something much more uh, uh, widespread, uh, a more regional kind of approach like, you know, you would do in Los Angeles. So uh, I'm, you know, and there are uh, incentive uh, uh, grants, uh, discretionary grants available uh, to test out uh, innovative uh, pilots and innovative strategies. So I would encourage uh, uh, LA Metro to look at this combination that nobody has done so far. You know, it's what we want to find out is can this combination produce better results than each each strategy being implemented by itself and and we really need a pilot demonstration to show how that will work you know with the new technologies that we are talking about you know uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the synergy between the two all right thank you for that Kimberly, can i make Please. make it even more this is sanjeev nanda from sandag uh, and I want to make it e a little bit, uh, Patrick, a little bit more messier than even those two uh, combinations. And I thought I'd just introduce it. And uh, I know that I don't have a thought about how to go about it. But if we can um, start a, start measuring uh, whether we're whether start measuring equity in some way, uh, as uh, Sam is uh, discussing. Um, one thought is that uh, the private providers of uh, these on-demand ride pooling services uh, can can be set equity targets um, you know to be achieved and then uh, you have a method by which you're not just flowing uh, congestion pricing dollars into uh, subsidies and incentives uh, for equity but you're actually uh, 
specifying policy targets for equity for private providers. And I think that's another path that should be explored in, you know, piloted and so on and so forth. I, I know it's sort of out there, but uh, maybe it's worth thinking about. So, well, I, actually, that paper I mentioned that I presented at uh, Transportation Research Board in January that is now published talks about how this thing would work, a public-private partnership with exactly the kind of things you're bringing out, you know, they would be rewarded based on targets, you know, and uh, once they achieve a certain target, there's a possibility that the amount of subsidies may be required will increase, right? So that might be a financial viability for the agency if the toll revenues coming in are not adequate to pay for these subsidies. So I also talk about a cap on those incentives. And so you're pushing the risk now onto that private vendor and having them, just like we saw on the I-10 express lanes, they would have to moderate those prices to get the optimum level of ride sharing that would maximize their own profits. But at the same time, they benefit society because they are trying to optimize ride sharing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think you bring up a very important point, Sanjeev, in that any of these equity conversations, um, you have to put the metrics forward. We really have to say, this is the goal of what we're looking towards. Because if not, it'll get lost within all of the complexities of doing the project. So it's great to see that LA Metro and the conversations now are having that front and center. Um, and then again, putting the metrics there. What does it really mean? How do we define it? Um, what does equity, how does, how does it come about in, in sort of the real world perspective? As just opposed to, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just that, you know, in mode kind of terminology that everybody's using. But how does it come into practice? So it's an important part. Thank you for bringing that forward. Um, there's no other comments there. Uh, we have another from Arnold San Miguel from SCAG, our other MPO. We just heard from our, our neighbors to the south. But um, do we know marginal benefits of building a traffic engineer's ideal express lane system on the I-10? For example, um, having bus only express lane and bus only on-ramp, off-ramps in addition to the system being built versus um, in addition to the system being built, so I'll leave it at that. Gary or Will, do you have a response for that one? Well, I have some thoughts I'd be happy to share on, uh, around this. I think um, Sandag I-15 is a good example of, of how to integrate a, a HIV Express and, and transit facility all in one. And for those of you who traveled down there, you'll know that there are multiple um, direct access ramps into the express lanes that are connected to the four or five transit centers along the corridor. So that's a really great example of, of how to have a more integrated corridor that, that leverages multiple travel modes. Um, as far as the, the bus only lanes, I think my, my perspective on managed lanes is really trying to optimize throughput and, and, make, and my concern with a transit only lane is that you may be moving high capacity vehicles, but at a lower frequency. So I, I prefer to see a mix of all, all modes, um, SOV, HOV, and, and, and transit to maximize the throughput. So you aren't wasting space within our, you know, valuable space within our quarters that's getting underutilized. So when we were looking at the I-10, I-15, we did look at the transit type connections to these express lanes, but again, you had to have a very high density development around there to serve that people that want to go to that spot for work in that and right now in the Inland Empire we don't have it so it didn't pencil out yeah it brings to mind also what happens when we have the EVs uh, or sorry when we have the autonomous vehicles so when we have vehicles that are communicating with each other what does it mean for our, our express lane um, our express lane pieces and how does that work into our future considerations of the build out? Because if we think about if, if the if the ideal and maybe it's so far out that we don't need to <laughs> totally take it into consideration, but that ideal is 
if we have vehicles communicating, um, it will reduce the amount of traffic as we don't have that human error or that human piece within the within the functioning of the system. Um, you take that out. So will will a lot of our traffic be alleviated? Um, but again, is it so far out that we don't have that in consideration of the express lanes today? But actually, there's been some studies that shown they've shown that the traffic's going to increase because people like won't be using transit because you can put your 14 year old son in a car and let them go to wherever they're going to go. So it could yeah. increase traffic. Mm. Great point. Um, there was another, a second point. Uh, Arnold did want to say that these are his personal questions and not from SCAD, but um, also the point of that to use the express lanes only once in a while um, and not pay a monthly fee to actually use something that they will only use uh, maybe once or twice a year. It's a very good point. And Yeni, I, I see that you have a comment here, a couple comments. Would you like to, um, would you like to just speak um, to it as opposed to me reading it? Of course, yes. So, so really, uh, one of the things is, uh, so first of all, I, I do appreciate the um, Arnold's comment there on the user journey. That's that's one which is important, which I think, uh, Kimberly, you mentioned there, which is um, kind of on the spot demand is not easy. Uh, with uh, with these types of solutions that we have right now with express lanes. And uh, I have the same issue, right? I, I will not apply for easy pass in Virginia and I live in Virginia uh, to use those express lanes. Uh, there is this question though, I do like the idea of, um, so uh, the answer is very, like the question is very technical in a way of how uh, those vehicles are gonna be used uh, to utilize some of the APIs that we push out there uh, from Shiva. Um, and uh, really it's retrofit option. Um, so when you look into the world of connected vehicles today uh, in the United States, is you will find that most of them have the capability to actually deliver this type of connectivity from like 2016 on. Uh, some of the actual makes uh, and models are only available with connectivity room 2020. Uh, the question, the answer to this question though, is that we have multiple options to deliver this type of API solution on the vehicle. Uh, if you continue to use kind of older vehicles, older models out there, you know, your classical Corvette or whatever, Buick, uh, then uh, we have the aftermarket devices to enable this um, solution. Uh, we also are currently in touch with some of the insurance companies as well uh, to deploy on their existing OBD2 devices, the telematics usage-based insurance devices out there. Uh, the uh, difference between talking about the smartphone itself is that smartphone by itself does not allow for this type of uh, precision of the, of the location up to the guest bump level, up to the toll lane accuracy. Um, and that is uh, not so much about kind of the limitation of technology development because you have hundreds of engineers at Google, at Uber and all the other companies. Uh, it talks more about the limitations of the hardware itself, <laughs> the physical constraints of a smartphone, which just doesn't have the GPS antenna that would be a patch antenna, it has a cylindrical antenna. So it cannot really resolve the multi-pass effects and really resolve up to the lane accuracy or guest bump accuracy or parking space accuracy. Therefore, um, unfortunately, despite the fact that many of the toll management companies did try uh, to do a lot of things, including Go Toll, I believe Transurban did uh, this project in uh, in, in Virginia. Uh, that is just not an easy way. And the second piece about smartphone is that you know people just forget to put it on. Uh, they you know they disallow location. They only allow location to be shared while using the app, and they just forget to put it on when they go through some spaces, and then location is not being tracked. What do you do with that? How do you make sure that it's enforceable? Uh, to the degree that, uh, especially when it comes to public um, aspects of taxation and other things, it needs to be enforceable, which is why we're utilizing the vehicle really itself uh, to push this type of uh, technology out there and make it infrastructure independent as, as much as possible. Sorry about that. Um, following up to that, there is a question for you, um, Yanni. The, the idea of the no architecture charge and pushing technology to help mankind to use your API Shiva, um, will there be a certain year of car that will be able to support the API since some drivers have old school vehicles or API will solely be used on a smartphone? So a bit more on, on the technology that you, you began to address it. But. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I more or less actually tried to address that question, Kimberly, uh, more with my, with my response. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, indeed, that's, um, I mean, the question that we have in the market today, just to kind of step back a little bit, is what does the future looks like, right? Um, in terms of how our next generation of vehicles, next generation of mobility and transportation is going to look like, because some of those aspects we're talking about, congestion pricing, express lanes, there are things that have been there for quite some time. And the question is, will there be some type of revolution, which we expected of types of Uber, you know, car sharing, these types of things that kind of have been dropped on us or Tesla was there really this futuristic concept of electric vehicles and uh, how we drive uh, just all together. So this is the question that I think we need to answer whether we would expect some of the evolutionary development uh, of how we move around and, you know, vehicles gradually becoming better and better. Uh, and we figure out better and better ways of how we manage our road infrastructures. Uh, or there might be some breakthrough technologies such as, you know, Elon Musk's uh, boring company. Um, and, you know, we get tunnels um, into L.A. and what happens next, right? Mm -hmm. So do we actually change the whole way of how we think about road management and, and things like that? Therefore, like it's really about uh, figuring out what are the bigger trends. And for us, it's all about vehicle location-based services and e-commerce as how we look into the space around the vehicle the vehicle being an ecosystem play. Uh, and uh, it all comes down to four main aspects, uh, which we were talking about. Location, identity, presence, and ubiquitous notifications. Because all of this are enabling this push from e-commerce to mobile commerce to vehicle commerce, right? Uh, until you can identify who that is, where you are, and what service you need to get, uh, and what like what is your context, there's absolutely no way to deliver direct uh, application to the driver from the vehicle perspective. That is why you need infrastructure to actually, again, to address exactly those four, location, identity, presence, and ubiquitous notifications. So this things, once we solve it from the vehicle itself, then it's beautiful. Then we're just, we're set, right? But right now we just couldn't, we were not able to do that until now. Uh, and that is why we had to uh, rely on infrastructure quite a bit, which I hope is our next step is Kind of get rid of some of that infrastructure at least uh, to some degree. All right, that's great. Thank you so much for those clarifications. So I have a question for for everyone around this this table. Um, what about uh, heavy duty vehicles and logistics? So how does how are we thinking about the logistics factors or or the movement of goods across our region, which is a very important part of the inland empire, um, the amount of truck traffic that we have. So how does that how does congestion pricing, and we've really talked about it from a personal vehicle standpoint here, but how does it also work with our, our, our system of logistics and, and, and heavy duty vehicle traffic? So I can uh, start. I mean, uh, yeah, they would pay the, uh, the price, they would pay the toll. And usually there is some uh, multiple of the normal toll rate that's charged to, uh, to cars. Uh, that uh, trucks pay, and it could be two times or three times the rate. But the important thing is that the value of the time they save is going to be much more than whatever toll they pay to travel during rush hours. So it will be a net benefit for them. So it's not really going to be an issue for them uh, because they are actually going to benefit. Mm -hmm. Are there additional incentives that you've thought or that you've been thinking about for truck traffic or for the truck drivers um, and for com trucking companies to use the, the express lanes? Well, in congestion Thank pricing, they have an automatic incentive to travel during off-peak hours and not pay any toll. So, uh, you know, it does, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's what congestion pricing is supposed to do is uh, show people what the true cost of their desire to travel during rush hours is. And if it is worth their, uh, their time, and they are willing to pay that toll. If they are not, they uh, either travel during off-peak or they uh, 
use transit or whatever, they find another way. So the price is what uh, allows the most economic efficiency to occur because only those who value the service at the level of the toll will use the facility. That's why congestion pricing is so economically efficient. And every analysis that I've done shows a five to one uh, benefit cost ratio because uh, you know the costs are minimal just for the technology and the benefits are all these time savings which are far in excess of the value of the toll. All right, thank you so much. Um, Will, did you have any piece that you wanted to put there? No, I, I, I do think that, I guess, to add a little bit to the topic, I think that um, we have seen some applications of, of truck tolling across the country. Um, there's been facilities constructed in Texas designed to, to bypass major freeway systems. I don't necessarily think that's a, an option here for Southern California, but there's other applications like in, in uh, Rhode Island where they, they installed tolling just for, for trucks. So I think that um, do, do I think that we should be doing truck truck congestion pricing? I don't know if I have the, the policy decision there, but the from a from a implementation perspective, there's certainly good case studies to look to uh, and, and study as, as you consider that as, a, as an approach for Southern California. All right. Tam, has, is LA Metro thinking at all about the logistics factor and the logistic traffic um, within this scheme? So um, as part of this, uh, so we are using the 2020 SCAG activity-based model, which actually includes elements for uh, being able to uh, better understand uh, truck travel. And so uh, we are uh, uh, diving through the data to figure out, well, how, wh what are the origin destination pairs for, uh, for a heavy duty truck? How are they gonna be affected by the pilot program area, whether they're traveling through it or, um, going to be affected somehow by it. So I think that once we actually um, have a better understanding of how truck traffic is going to be affected by it, we'll have a better understand of, uh, understanding of how to, uh, what are the policy levers mm -hmm. that are available and uh, to engage the, the GIZ movement community to, uh, to uh, explore that further. All right, thank you so much. Um, there was another comment here on our chat from David Pickerel, another great friend and also part of the Shiva AI organization. So as the survey others have alluded to, the link between congestion scheme revenues and better transportation alternatives and better transit is critical. So yes, we need to, we do see that there is um, really that need for not just uh, congestion pricing schemes, but also the, the, the transit um, position. I was involved with several scheme developments around the world in the 2000s, and this connection either wasn't solidified or at least not communicated, and most schemes failed in part as a result. In contrast, this was clearly committed in Stockholm with from the outset and contributed to the ongoing public acceptance and continued patronage of the scheme. Thank you for that um, comment, David, and I'll I don't know, Doran, if you want to say anything from the position of Foothill Transit um, regarding the role of transit within this. Well, I, I think, um, you know, as we look to all of these different solutions, and I think we're seeing this as we're coming out of COVID, our whole transportation system is really, it's, it's almost an ecosystem in some respects. And as we make changes in that, we have to figure out what are the what are the counterbalances that make it all work. Um, I definitely think transit can play a, a role in terms of congestion pricing. Um, at the same time, we've got to be mindful. And someone mentioned this earlier that um, you know density or lack of density becomes a challenge in terms of having a really good transit network that can support um, and and be part of that ecosystem. So clearly, being a transit guy, transit's got to be part of the solution, and we saw that in the polling. But it's not as easy as it as it first looks, and so I think we've got to continue to struggle and experiment and try different things to see ultimately how do we get the ecosystem to a better spot than where it is now, which is often characterized by freeways that aren't they may be free but they don't move, and that isn't creating mobility. That's just creating you know mental mental craziness. So none of this is easy. 
No, it's not. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Aaron. Um, sorry, Doran. Aaron Rogers, do you have any comments? I know that you're trying a number of different schemes within the Omnitrans. I'm not sure. Good morning. Yes, we Good are. Morning, um, um, no, I completely agree with Doran. I mean, we're we're at a point where we we are post COVID reevaluating everything that we're doing and all of the approaches we're taking to best meet the needs with the resources that we have. And, you know, I think as we have these discussions, um, we will certainly be poised and ready to, to participate and assist in figuring out where we will fit in. Uh, but to all of the discussion, I think there's a lot of challenges that are still there for us. Um, but I mean, we, we are the, the entities you know, regionally who have the resources to, to assist with the issues that we're trying to resolve. Yeah. So again, thank you. Thank you for hearing from our two transit partners. Um, the importance of transit and how um, maybe the resources that are needed to help support and build out transit facilities and transit options within, um, within our region. I know that, um, you know, both of our transit partners are working on different solutions with, with Omnitrans doing Omni Ride. So some of that micro transit coming about and, um, and Foothill Transit, you know, really pushing sort of the envelope on, on different methods and modes of, of transit. So um, we thank them both for being here. We're almost out of time, but just to, you know, not ignore the comments, but thinking about logistics and maybe this is a, a um, the logistics industry, maybe this is a, a, a question for one of our future dialogues and really thinking about how the heavy duty um, logistics sector can play within our overall um, congestion pricing scheme to make sure that it works well for the consumers, of course, because there are concerns about rising prices but also um, rising prices within the lanes themselves. So if there are additional heavy duty vehicles using those lanes, will that rise the, 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 the cost for the average consumer? Um, issues we can't completely look at or, or focus on further today because we are out of time, but I wanted to thank our planning committee, um, Doran and Aaron, or you just heard from two of them who help us put together these, these dialogues, as well as our partners with HNTB I'm Greg Kohlsizer and Carrie Witt, who are unable to be with us today. Um, thank you very much for all of your support in, in planning, but also in your in monetary support, as well as, again, thanks to Kathleen for helping with our logistics just within this position, as well as um, Danny Chung, who is a, a, uh, a former grad student with, with the LTC and, and transitioning. Um, I hope you will all join us on August 24th for our next dialogue and where we tackle the issues of big data and the transit system. So thinking about how we can improve our transit, our public transit through the use of big data. Thank you all. I hope you all have a wonderful day and for being with us today in this important discussion, but one that obviously we didn't have enough time to truly get to all of the points. So thank you so much. We'll see you at our next dialogue.